Uh, good evening, everybody. Hello. Um, I'm actually uh, uh, with you from Memphis, Tennessee, where I happen to be one of the hosts of uh, Adam Arthur, who's one of the panelists today, um, sitting in my hotel room here. And uh, welcome to uh, the monthly University of Miami CV and Skullbase uh, Symposium. This is session number 51 in a series uh, today on January 26, 2023. I will introduce the speakers shortly, but again, I'd like to always thank our co-directors of this marvelous series, Carolina Benjamin, Mike Ivan, Bobby Stark, and I think Carolina and Bobby are with us today as well. And our two current uh, fellows, our external cerebrovascular skull base fellow, Matthew Sun, and our infolded 
PGY4, uh, cerebrovascular skull based fellow, Eva Wu, and both of them will each show one case uh, for our panelists to discuss. So here is Matt, who, uh, uh, by the way, is have has a wonderful job waiting for him and in Dallas uh, at UT Southwestern when he's done with us. So congrats. Uh, and Eva, of course, has to pay her dues and finish her, her residency, unfortunately. Uh, next month, uh, uh, save the date for February 23rd for a marvelous uh, session on orbital lesions. As you know, we, we neurosurgeons really need to understand the orbit very well. It's actually quite a bit simpler than, than the brain. So fantastic uh, panelists you can see there. Join us for that. And of course, you can review all the sessions we've recorded to date since the pandemic uh, on our YouTube channel. And you can see those links there. As always, during the lectures today, at any time, go ahead and put in your questions in the Q&A box, and I promise you we will answer all of them by, by the end of the session. Uh, now, my great pleasure to introduce, in the order in which they are going to speak, about 20 minutes each, uh, Chris Ogilvie, Professor of Neurosurgery at Harvard and at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, of course, an extremely accomplished both open and endovascular uh, neurosurgeon. And Chris is going to talk to us about small aneurysms to treat or not to treat, extremely time, timely and relevant topic in, in this area of uh, in this er era of what I think can be an era of abuse sometimes of treating tiny aneurysms. Uh, second, Carlos. Carlos has moved after many years of being at Leahy Clinic. He's now professor of neurosurgery and vice chair of education and the skills lab and division chief of CV at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where he joined Nelson Oyeshiku, um, just started this year. Uh, Carlos is going to talk to us about the optimal approach to a tough problem the blister aneurysms, and that's always controversial, and that's going to be fun to talk about. And last but not least, uh, Adam Arthur uh, last year became prof, and uh, prof uh, became chair, uh, a professor and chair of the University of Tennessee Sam's Murphy Clinic here in Memphis, Tennessee, and of course, uh, superbly accomplished open and endovascular as well. And he's going to talk about the role of stage treatment and retreatment of aneurysms. So there we go. Enough of my monologue. So I'll invite now Chris to share his screen, unmute your microphone, and start your presentation. We see your presentation, and but you are still muted. I don't know what happened. You chopped the screen is chopped in half. You you had it okay before. You're muted, though, Chris. There we go. Sorry about that. There we go. Everything okay? See it all Perfect. right? Perfect. Thanks very much. Jacques, listen, thanks very much for the invitation. I really enjoy these uh, sessions. And as you know, I jump on a number of them um, when I'm not speaking, but also love it when we speak because it really generates great discussion in our group prior to the meeting about the meeting coming up and the topic. So I'm going to talk about small intracranial aneurysms, big things happening with tiny lesions. And as Jacques says, there's a lot going on in practice that uh, we're going to talk about. And just, I'd really like to get the discussant's perspective on some of this. I'd really like to acknowledge my partner, Phil Towski, who's co-director here at the annual, at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and our clinical fellows, Max Shutran and Michael Young, who've contributed uh, to the discussions I'm going to talk about, as well as um, some of the slides I'm going to show you. 
I have a few disclosures, none uh, relevant to this presentation. And I thought for fun, I would just start off with this little, uh, I'll just show you a couple of really quick cases. This is a woman we saw about two and a half hours ago in clinic for the first time. She's 58, nurse, uh, has this left ophthalmic region aneurysm, three millimeters, red is an aneurysm. Um, and it's detected after she had a little, she thinks she's getting some word finding problems. Uh, no spells, but just sort of worse over time. She was a former heavy smoker um, uh, and her mother died from a ruptured aneurysm. So in Boston, this is a uh, one hour discussion. <laughs> and for Carlos's benefit, I put up the fact that occasionally these paraclinoid lesions come through unruptured, two millimeters, and they're read by radiologists as a blister aneurysm. And of course, as we're gonna learn from Carlos, that is a completely different entity but on the, inter on the internet, it says blister, they got the diagnosis blister and they come running to your office thinking they're gonna die. Uh, and when really you're trying to reassure them how they need not only no more treatment, but barely any follow-up. Uh, this is another patient we saw this week, uh, you know, 43 year old uh, data scientist has this tiny little bump on the ACOM, um, uh, no family history, no smoking. And we're just going to keep an eye on this. And we can talk about what keeping an eye on it means in terms of how frequent. We've done a lot of work with how frequent scans should be obtained, what's cost effective, what's health effective. Uh, but he gets coital headaches. And that's why he got this scan. And this is a 60-year-old female, two millimeter ACOM, non-smoker, no family history. Uh, she has this tiny aneurysm, which we're watching and plan for follow-up uh, imaging. So in decision-making, obviously, we all just balance the natural history risks. That is, what happens if the lesion is left untreated against the treatment-related risks? And size of the lesion is only one of the factors in this whole process. So I'm just going to review a little bit uh, some things that are published, some things that aren't. Natural history data, data that's, uh, and the data is evolving to try to stratify the risks of individual lesions based on several overall factors. And then treatment-related risks. And this is where the, 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 curve, the pendulum is swinging very quickly because these involve lesion and patient-specific factors uh, in terms of the risks of treatment, but also our tools of treatment, I think is what Jock was alluding to. As they get safer, we have to be careful where these are offered and, and whether they're justified. Um, so for the natural history, there are both patient and lesion-specific factors, size, location, age of patient, because that dictates life horizon. Uh, and then risk factors that are modifiable, smoking, ethnicity, which is not, and female, but these can influence the natural history of an aneurysm. And then the risk of treatment, which are also patient and lesion-specific factors, age, size, co comorbidities. Uh, there is decreasing risk with improved technology, as we'll look at. Um, and we, as I think all the speakers, use both open and endovascular techniques to select the lowest risk, highest efficacy type of treatment. In terms of the natural history, I'm not going to drag you through all these studies, but this is what we talk about and use when we couch our discussions often with patients, the International Study of Unruptured Aneurysms, the UCAS, the Japanese Study of Unruptured Aneurysms, which is basically a, uh, a, a rehash of the issue of trial, but I'll show you some caveats about that some meta-analysis and often uh, the phases score comes into, dis dis uh, into discussion. In terms of the international study, this is a, this is a diagram that, or a table that sometimes patients bring in their pocket to the office visit. Um, and as you'll all remember, this is the second publication of the issue of trial. The first was in 1998, this was in 2003. And there's of course two groups, those that had no previous history of subarachnoid hemorrhage and those that did. The point I'm showing this is it's for the first time is when the issue of data was really broken down by location, what they called anterior and posterior circulation. And we all know there's many caveats to this data, many editorials written, but basically patients will come with this and saying, gee, I am group one and I have a less than seven millimeter aneurysm, so I have no chance of a hemorrhage. Well, nothing zero, of course. Uh, and then it stratifies the risk, not only by site, and here for posterior circulation lesions, I think everyone knows these were vertebral basilar and posterior communicating artery lesions, which some argue should not be included in that. But then obviously uh, size does influence potential risk of rupture. Well, following this study, small aneurysms were typically considered less than seven millimeters. And interestingly, despite this study showing that little aneurysms had a really low incidence of hemorrhage in this study, it was in the New England Journal, so lots of general physicians got hold of this data. 
And interestingly, the number of unruptured treat aneurysms treated in the United States actually increased after this publication, despite the issue of data showing higher surgical complications when followed prospectively than previously reported, and that the rupture rates were lower than previously reported. This is a paper from 2021 looking at a national database, uh, lacking, looking at the national database data, and I think we all pretty much know this well, but now uh, you can see 2003 um, in this study, on this graph for treated aneurysms, which is when the issue of trial was published for the second time, there was a big jump in the number of aneurysms being treated. And this shows those uh, unruptured versus ruptured, but the number of unruptured lesions went up significantly. And as we all know, I think um, uh, the ones, the aneurysms diagnosed uh, for unruptured aneurysms has ascended and crossed those with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then there's the other graphs here to show that endovascular treatment is used more frequently than clipping for unruptured lesions. And uh, this really uh, um, uh, harkens to the fact that this, the paper was published and more lesions were, treating, were being treated. And part of that's related to this glaring fact. That is, when patients present with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, 75% have lesions less than 10 millimeters. So when unruptured lesions are small, they're less likely to bleed. Yet when aneurysms bleed, they're likely to be small. And we've all clipped a five millimeter ruptured MCA aneurysm, come up to the clinic and see a patient, and they have the exact same lesion on their, on their scan, and we're left with this discussion. Um, this is a paper from Cornell uh, from 2017, and they looked at epics of subarachnoid hemorrhage versus size. And you can see that the smaller than five, they looked at lesions smaller than five millimeters. And basically, over time, what we're seeing, and these are the different epics shown here uh, by time interval, but over time, the number of lesions or percentage of lesions, zero to five millimeters, is, uh, has been increasingly, has been increasing, as you can see here. Um, enter the Japanese study, which now is, you know, 11 years old, uh, but it's still data that's talked about quite a bit. And th this study was important because it did uh, stratify patients' risk of hemorrhage by not only site, really more detailed and more granular than ever before, but also by size. And really the interesting thing are these three and four and five and six millimeter groups. Um, and then these curves on the side show the uh, stratification of these based on probability of rupture based on these various factors. Uh, and um, this is a graph, this is a graph from their publication. But what it shows is there was a fairly high number of three to six millimeter lesions. So this drove a lot of the data in this study. And as we all know, really, the conclusions of this study, some in keeping with it had previously been shown, some which wasn't, but greater than seven millimeters increased risk of rupture. ACOM and PCOM, but not posterior circulations, were at significantly increased risk of rupture. And women and patients with hypertension had increased risk. But interestingly, prior subarachnoid hemorrhage, smoking history, and family history, uh, and the presence of multiple aneurysms were not associated with increased risk of rupture. But then here, and it shows those relative risk factors and hazard ratios. But we're starting to see data of ruptured and unruptured aneurysms stratified by size, SAIT, and the other thing the Japanese study showed first time really statistically was that irregular shape, that is um, uh, irregular shape of the aneurysm carried with it a higher risk of rupture. This is a follow-up paper from Journal of Neurosurgery in 2020 by the same authors. And it's a, it's a bit of a difficult read, at least for me, but they looked at the risk of small and ruptured aneurysms bleeding. And this is from that paper. And you can see these were the number of patients entered into the UCAS study in the blue bars. And you see a very large number of small aneurysms that, dom that were in this study. And then they went ahead and looked at the rupture rate, which you can barely see the line on the bottom of the graph because it's the dashed line down here. Um, uh, and, the, and then the treated aneurysms, many aneurysms treated in the small size range. So mo the conclusion from this paper was that most of the UCAS aneurysms were small, 25% three millimeters, 22% four millimeters, but most common ruptures were in the seven millimeter range. And that there was an annual risk of rupture for three and four millimeter aneurysms, as you can see here, although it was very low. Uh, so, and that the risk for small aneurysm rupture were, dom were the significant factors were prior subarachnoid hemorrhage, uncontrolled hypertension, ACOM, and discovery, discovery on what they called screening brain checkup. Well, 
This is a graph I made uh, using binomial theorem to predict risk of rupture based on some of the UCAS data. And you can see that for the seven to nine millimeter lesion, this is number of years of follow-up and risk of, of hemorrhage over time, that the number becomes pretty significant at a, uh, at, by a two years or above 3% and by five years up around 8% risk of hemorrhage. However, there is a number for the three and four millimeter lesions. By five years, you're running about 1.8% risk of hemorrhage. And this kind of thinking and data, I think, is partially driving what we're seeing, which is more smaller lesions being treated in the unruptured state over time. Well, how about multiple aneurysms? Here's a patient who's 50, and you can see she has four small aneurysms. Does she have, she does not have, as we all know, four times the risk of rupture of one aneurysm. I think it is higher. I don't think it's known statistically how much higher that is. So I posit the question, does a patient with three unruptured aneurysms have triple the risk of hemorrhage? And we say, no, it's probably increased, but by how much it's not known. But if one is bled, as all of you know, the patient is often extremely motivated to treat the other lesions, regardless of size. Uh, and that enters into the psychology of the aneurysms. And then there's autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Here's a 61 year old who had uh, polycystic kidney disease. She had a successful renal transplant, strong family of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And she has this A1 lesion, which is irregular in shape. She has no M1, it was occluded uh, asymptomatically. But after lots of discussion with this woman, here's her 3D. You can see it's in a regular shape, little three millimeter thing. Uh, we went ahead with surgery. And of course, at surgery, as all of you know, especially in the polycystics, these are red, uh, very angry looking lesions. Here's a perforator next to it. The M1 was occluded. And this is actually the M1, this white thing here and down here. Um, but we went ahead and clipped this and sh she did well. Should we have done that? We can discuss that. And the phases scores uh, uh, many people use to help guide decision making, but in terms of size, really, you only start to get points on the phases score for size above seven millimeters uh, on up, and then that adds to the risk of rupture. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's the anxiety over an unruptured aneurysm. <laughs> and at least in Boston, we spend a lot of time in clinic reducing anxiety uh, and telling people why they don't need treatment as opposed to why they do. Uh, family history enters into this. If they've seen a loved one die of an aneurysm, uh, you know, I've had patients tell me, I don't care what size it is, I want it fixed. And then there's the physician anxiety, that is primary care physicians who learned in med school that aneurysms were dangerous, so they should get treatment, which actually, as long as they end up in your hand as the expert, probably isn't such a bad thing. Uh, so natural history modifiers, size, location, lobularity, and multiplicity of lesions, possibly. Patient-specific factors, younger patients, because they have a longer life horizon. So the 30-year-old with a four-millimeter aneurysm may have a very different consideration and discussion than the 78-year-old with a four-millimeter aneurysm. And then there's the family history, ethnicity, their anxiety, and smoking, which I think plays a huge role in growth and rupture of these lesions. Now, let me just flip the coin and look uh, at um, uh, the, the treatment-related risks, and then I'll finish up. And just like with natural history, there are patient-specific factors and lesion-specific factors for treatment. As we all know, size, increased risk uh, with increased size, location, calcification, and local anatomic details. And this is true for both endovascular and surgical strategies. So there's stratification of treatment-related risks. And I think we can all, and we all do this in our practice, basically highly select treatment, which is appropriate for each patient. But the treatment risk is not static. And as the, as the surgical specialty progresses, we see a change in this. This is a paper we published a couple of years ago, and it's using endovascular and surgical management to look at outcomes from unruptured aneurysms. And we had 658 aneurysms in a little over 550 patients. Um, and the other point to be made for this paper was during the same interval, we evaluated 950 patients, which merited no treatment whatsoever and were followed or told they don't need any follow-up during the same interval. But basically with this, we were able to get risks of, of treatment uh, versus size and location of aneurysm. And we compared this to an earlier series that Bob Carter and I had published in 2003 with about the same number of patients, very similar distribution of age and sizes. 
uh, the, I can't lay the graphs on top of each other because our previous study was Glasgow outcome score and the current study was modified Rankin score. But when using both endovascular and surgical results, these lines show various sizes in the anterior and posterior location. And that's what the, these bars show. And for our surgical series, it's the same thing. I won't drag you through the statistics we use to generate these curves, but basically for the posterior circulation, large lesions, you can see the distribution of outcome in terms of poor outcome based on patient age and size of aneurysm. This is a 15 millimeter posterior circulation lesion as age, acceler as age increases, whereas a small aneurysm in the anterior circulation, five millimeters, has a risk profile much lower, but still only surgery has a higher risk than combined modality management. So overall treatment risks of unruptured aneurysms are decreasing over time. And that's because of increased use of endovascular techniques, better surgical results. So the question is, is they're changing for the criteria? Flow diversion has certainly driven some of this. Are more lesions being treated, smaller lesions, more paraclinoid lesions, uh, and are older patients being treated? I'll show you a few more slides and stop. Uh, this is what neurovascular specialists say they do. And this was a, some, this was a survey we did, uh, published last year, um, where we asked uh, interventional specialists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, and radiologists management of certain aneurysms. And for two to four millimeter aneurysms, you can see here that most favored surveillance, uh, only a little under 4% favored routine treatment, um, and a little under 9% favored treatment if there was some high risk feature. And then we looked at intervals of treatment, which is a different part of this paper I won't get into. When we looked at five to seven millimeter aneurysms, look what happens to the decision-making. Routine treatment should be considered 73.5%. Uh, and when you combine that with the high risk patients, it's almost 80% of lesions which are recommended for treatment. And this is still up to seven millimeters, not over. So is there a change of unruptured aneurysm being treated? Uh, the lower, lower overall risks of treatment using endovascular and surgical techniques. Is this affecting the size of aneurysm that's being treated? And will artificial intelligence influence the monitoring of growth and decision-making for intracranial aneurysms? You've seen some of the papers that are being published on artificial intelligence following aneurysms. We all know now there are artificial intelligence programs that when a scan is done within your hospital system, an aneurysm pops up. It doesn't matter if it's one millimeter or 10 millimeters, it goes right to your cell phone. No neurologist, no interventionist, no radiologist, right to your cell phone and you're left figuring out what to do with it. But some of the recent papers are suggesting that the linear maximal measurements that we have made with cursors may be inaccurate and that actually a volumetric type analysis may be a better analysis for these lesions. So it'll be interesting to see as these small lesions, if AI picks up small changes in growth, would that be utilized for a criteria for treatment? Now, I said to you what, what vast neurovascular specialists said they were doing. Here's what they're actually doing. And this is data that's not published. We're working it up for publication, but we reviewed the, the world literature. And you can see here, this represents over 35,000 patients in 240 studies. And this looks at aneurysm size treatment over time. And the various dots represent each study and the sample size of each study is, is commensurate with the size of the dot. And then here's a bar graph showing the same thing. But for all aneurysms that we could find, and there was search criteria, I won't get into at this moment, but you can see between 1990 and 2020, the average size of aneurysm being treated is coming down pretty dramatically. And this is true for both endovascular reports and for open surgical reports. Um, uh, in addition, uh, we looked at developed and underdeveloped countries and many fewer patients to evaluate that are published from underdeveloped countries, a little over 5,000, uh, whereas there's almost 30,000 for developed countries, but the same type of trend is going on. And then we looked at different parts of the world. You can see here East Asia, pretty stable, Europe uh, with a decrease in treatment size over time and the United States with the largest change uh, over time. Um, and then we also looked at who was treating the lesion. And when you looked at neurosurgical special, specialists, uh, and this is both endovascular and surgical management, you can see the, the, the graph here versus other. This would be neurointerventional uh, neurologists and uh, radiologists. And you can see what's happening with size of treatment over time. 
So I will finish there. I hope I didn't run too much over. Um, unruptured aneurysms warrant careful consideration with multiple aneurysm-specific and patient-specific factors weighed for natural history and treatment-related risks. And as our imaging tools improve, you know, a lot of us are using wall enhancement. We don't know exactly what to do with that yet. Uh, shape and flow analysis and artificial intelligence, we may better develop uh, indications of small aneurysms at higher risk of rupture. So I'll finish there and uh, thank you for your attention. Um, appreciate the opportunity to present this. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, I, I usually will keep the discussion till after all three of you have spoken, but I'd like you to come back in the discussion time and talk about aneurysms that are documented to have grown on follow-up from two to three to four, what evidence we have that they should be treated and so forth. But anyway, you don't have to answer me now, but something we could all discuss later. If you can stop sharing your slides, and uh, I invite Carlos to talk about uh, the complex topic of blister aneurysms. Great review, by the way, Chris. Thank you. Great work. Okay. You guys seeing it? Yes, but go to presentation mode. Yeah, you go. Good. Good. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Jacques, for the invitation. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, I was present for the first one that you did. And we were presenting cases, I think, to Dr. Spetzler. So it's, it's nice to be coming around the circle 50 times later. Um, and yes, Chris, you're right. Uh, the Boston patient is very different. Um, I'm getting used to the patient here that doesn't do that. But uh, just as an anecdote, I had a Boston patient recently and I saw her in post-op a couple of days ago in clinic and she was all happy with everything. And then she said, but I have a few comments and she pulls out her little notebook. And I felt like I was right back in Boston and it was complaints about the food and the nurses and everything else. All right, blister aneurysm. So I was charged with, is there an optimal management approach? And I'm gonna try to do this. And I need to acknowledge my two PGY6 superstars, uh, Nathan Quigg and Darsha. Shastri, um, two phenomenal residents who are looking to become vascular surgeons, endovascular surgeons, and skull base surgeons. So keep an eye out for them. All right, my disclosure has nothing to do with anything here tonight. So what is the problem? So, you know, these are, like Chris said, the radiologist might call something a blister, but it really is a completely different disease. These are rare, extremely thin, fragile walled uh, blisters technically on, on the blood vessel. Um, they tend to occur on that supraclinoid portion of the carotid artery, but we've come to identify them in vessels basically anywhere. And it's interesting, if you go back through the history, O'Hara was the first to kind of remark in 1979 that these needed a completely different management than the standard clipping. And it was Takahashi who came up with the term kimami in Japanese, but or blood blister aneurysm. And again, we're seeing them in other vessels as well. So they're supposedly due to subadventitial dissections that lead to a defect in the wall, and then basically the, the, the rupture and the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Luckily, they are pretty rare. They're you know, about 1% of all aneurysms, and about a half a percent to 2% of all ruptured aneurysms. The issue is, they have an extremely high rate of re-rupture in a very short period of time. And a lot of times, you, you know, unless you're very suspicious or looking or thinking about them, and I'm gonna show a couple of examples, um, you may not see it, um, or they may not show up at all in the angiogram. And the reality is, is there an optimal management? Well, they've posed a challenge from both the surgical and the endovascular route. And they generally tend to have high grade hemorrhages and, and poor prognosis. And you know, here's a picture of one basically that you see here, the, the, the red uh, kind of blistery look to the vessel. So wh why do these occur? Um, there really is no conclusive uh, pathogenesis. Um, they feel, the, the, based on the studies, there's you know, arteriosclerotic uh, factors, hypertension, dissections potentially. Um, what's interesting is that they do not have an intimal or medial layer. They're really covered by just a fragile fibrous layer. And sometimes they're true false aneurysms being held together by a clot. Um, and that's in contradistinction to a standard saccular berry aneurysm that we all deal with that have the multiple layers that have broken down with inflammation and smooth muscle proliferation and apoptosis. 
Um, the current feeling though is that atherosclerotic remodeling may be the main cause here, that you get ulceration, destruction of the intimo with a hematoma that eventually leads to, to breakdown. Um, Interestingly, Bojanowski tried to create a classification scheme. Um, I'm not sure exactly how useful it really is, but basically he described the, the what he calls a type one as classic, being a part of the wall, like a blister on the wall without really a sac. A type two, which is more berry-like, uh, but the neck is not longer than the diameter of the vessel. And then in type three, the, the neck is longer than the diameter of the vessel. And then type four, basically it's a whole circumferential blowout. Um, so what are the treatment considerations? Um, they're, they're, they're challenging, they're difficult um, for both surgical reconstruction and for endovascular treatment. You know, this high rate of re-rupture and they have a very high rate of intraoperative rupture and I'll share that with you with my own uh, videos. Um, and so there have been treat, the, the direct clipping, the wrapping and trapping, uh, bypass with trapping, occluding the artery. Uh, these are all options that have kind of been used for these. Um, the endovascular route, they started with coiling, then a stent-assisted coiling, then multiple overlapping stents. And more recently, it seems like flow diversion is becoming kind of the mainstay and the, the treatment that everyone's uh, falling on. The point is that there's not been one treatment modality that's proven distinctly superior um, so far in the literature. So, Talking about surgical options, there's you know standard clipping, but frequently there's just too much diseased wall that it has no integrity to pull it together. Uh, so you can fall back on the sunk clip, which is not made anymore, or we can do what we call the wrap clip and uh, give Chris a chuckle here. I remember being a fellow for Dr. Spetzler back in 97, and every day we got a few uh, articles to review for him and for his editorial duties for the CNS Journal, the Red Journal. And I remember reviewing a technical paper by Chris on using Hemashield to wrap and use a clip to kind of the poor man's or I guess the rich man's stunt clip. Um, and so basically it is a technique that's been used. And uh, there's several Japanese paper that really argued in favor of that technique. Um, using plain old cotton, you know, the, the Dr. Spetzler and Dr. Barrow as to who came up with it, but using cotton and a clip to kind of pull things together and then, of course, vessel occlusion with or without a bypass or trapping with or without a bypass. Um, the endovascular route, the, again, coiling, stent coil, vessel occlusion, flow diversion with coils, without coils, overlapping stents or flow diversion, all of these have been tried. Um, it seems like the flow diverting method is optimal so far amongst the endovascular routes. The issues are vasospasm and then, again, dual antiplatelets in someone with a really bad subarachnoid hemorrhage who needs the EBD, may need a shunt. So these are the issues that kind of uh, affect this treatment. Whereas for the surgical treatment, I, I failed to mention, the, the main issue is intraoperative rupture um, and stroke, which, which tends to be higher. So here's an example of a case I dealt with a few years ago. I want to say like back in 2011 or 12. Um, and this was a 46-year-old hospital CFO who was found unconscious next to his desk. He was a GCS of seven and hemiparetic on arrival. And the CT showed really extensive subarachnoid hemorrhage, as you can see here. And he, interestingly, he had been down for several hours, and I don't know if he embolized or what, but he started showing signs of ischemia, and this is his pre-op scans, uh, in his internal capsule and so forth. And, you know, we did the CTA, which, you know, back then, I, my suspicion was not as high for these as it is nowadays, and I almost overlooked this completely. And then we did the full 3D angio and INSUP shows me this little bump. And I was like, okay, I guess that's it. So we took him to surgery and, and you know, this is what, what we found. Now, let me just move the video where it gets a little better. Here, here I'm basically putting temporaries above and below it. And you see this almost blow out of the whole wall. And a lot of it was actually ventral. And as soon as I start playing with it, of course, it starts to bleed and you'll see that here in a second. You'll see the blister on it right there. And, you know, this guy was poor grade. I, I was not ready to do a bypass in the situation. Brain was very, very swollen. And as soon as I touch it, watch, it starts to, it starts to go. And again, just argues about how, how fragile these things are. And still, you know, pretty brisk bleeding considering and again, most of this was ventral. So it was one of these where I ended up having to pull out a fenestrated clip 
and reconstruct the vessel as best I could without narrowing it too much. And I achieved that, but I was worried about this, you know, dorsum, which was also very, very blister-like. So in that situation, basically I put some cotton on it and then used another clip to kind of pinch that cotton onto that area. And surprisingly, you know, there was the ICG angiogram. Surprisingly, this guy did extremely well. He recovered. He ended up needing a BP shunt for hydrocephalus. And, you know, here's a CTA, which is I think like a seven or eight year follow-up. It's the last time I saw him and, you know, he actually got back to work. It was, it was a miraculous save given how bad he was coming in. Um, here's a second case. And I, I may want to stop this one and just ask Adam and, and Chris what they think. So here's a 51 year old who comes in with the explosive headache and the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And he's got this. And you see this kind of weird widening here. And now we, you see this. And so basically that whole A1 transitioning into the A2 segment is disease. And, you know, I think I'll, my, my, my talk's gonna be a little shorter than the 20 minutes. So I'll go ahead and maybe get you two to, just give me a comment. What, what would you guys do with this thing? Probably float avert. I guess I'd like to see better pictures. The other thing is almost none of my rupture blister aneurysms are men. Uh, you showed two men in a row. I don't know if that's just a weird sampling error, but for years and years, it always seems to be relatively young women. Hmm. No, for me, it's been men, honestly. So this was a Sunday afternoon. It's up out of town. And I don't think back then we would have flowed, diverted this. This was quite a while ago. So, you know, I, I took him to surgery just to see what I was dealing with. And I'll speed this up. Here's a better view of it. You can see the backside there. It had like a, a, almost a different sack coming out of it. But my concern was, I'm, I'm getting temporary control here, just preparing the A1. And then moving along the chiasm, let me just move this forward a little bit. And you'll see again, it's one of these where as soon as I touch it, so now we're starting to come up on it. You're starting to see the disease vessel there. And as soon as I touch it, there it goes. And of course, you get it under control. I bring in a patty and the cotton ball and so forth. Get the temporary clip on. And what I'm, what I end up finding, and okay, here it is now controlled. I've got a temporary clip on the opposite A1. Here it is involving the communicating segment, and it, this is all diseased. And I'm looking at this going, I'm not sure how I'm going to handle this. The bleeding point was here. And lucky for me, that bleeding point had a perforator free. There was no striates coming off in that area. So I was able to trap the bleeding point. I had good enough backflow from the other side. And essentially I trapped that segment. And then the part that was distal, it was involving that communicator with the branches coming off. I end up coagulating let me just get to that part there. There, this part I end up just coagulating and covering with cotton and called it a day. And that's why I was curious. I think today we probably would have flowed. I've ordered this, but you know, again, the, the, these limited options to deal with this. So what about this? So here's one where again, you, as, as Henri Bergson said, you, your eyes see what your mind's ready to see. So this person comes in with a hunt has four subarachnoid gets better after an EBD and he's got, this large ACOM. And so I see the little bump on the carotid, but I don't really think anything about it. And I'm going in to clip an ACOM. And as soon it's, as I got that classic, almost volcano like appearance, right? And it's right in the wrong place. Yep. yep. So I, I can't remember if it was Max Utron, who was actually the resident with me for this one. But as soon, and it's one of these, I wish I had video, but it was as soon as we opened the Dura, this is what I dealt with. You know, it just was a bloodbath. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, the blood's shooting from the wrong direction. It was like a sprinkler coming from the, car the carotid side versus the ACOM side. And it suddenly hit me, oh man, this is a blister that blew the ACOMs intact. We got it under control, everything went fine, but it was just, you, you know, you weren't prepared mentally. I was looking at that ACOM and I was totally fooled by this thing. So here's one of, for my, I guess it can happen to my endovascular colleagues as well. This person comes in with a subarachnoid hemorrhage and they have this superior hypothesis seal on the left side. 
They had this little anterior temporal aneurysm on the right side. And there's this, which was kind of overlooked. And they went ahead and treated the super epiphyseal and the uh, MCA anterior temporal branch. And a few days later, the patient has a rebleed and they take her back. And now we've got this situation where you see the whole walls disease. There's the aneurysm. They put a few coils in it. Would have loved to pipeline this, but look at the spasm. And I'm just wondering if you guys, what, what other option would there be here? Um, you know, I don't think there's a surgical option for this at the situation with that much spasm. And so, you know, this is how it was treated. Um, and unfortunately, the patient didn't ended up succumbing and did, did not do well from all the rebleeds. I don't know. I Adam did, Chris, did it rebleed from that construct though, or was that okay? Uh, so no, they did this and then it rebled again, and that was it. Ah, it's a shame because we we did have a woman with a gunshot wound and a pseudo aneurysm that we just waited out the spasm day by day. And when it got just big enough, we put a flow diverter in, <laughs> but it was yeah. literally just waiting for that spasm to resolve. So that's a shame. Yeah, no, it was it was disappointing. Yeah, and again, In hindsight's twenty twenty, but you know that last picture almost looks makes you think about a bypass, right? Uh, bypass and 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 occlusion of the carotid. I mean, the patient probably would have done terrible no matter what. That's another thing in my population. Not only are the blisters all women, but they they have an incredibly high um, severe spasm rate. Is that something wow. you've seen, Carlos? Yeah, me too. Me too. And you know, I. I, I Bypass. I'm. I'm. I'll be honest with you. I. I'm afraid to do a bypass in the setting of that much spasm. And yeah, so yeah. they don't do well in the setting of a spasm. It's a terrible time to do it. You. you so, make it. You know, I, I think these examples are kind of showing you what we're talking about. You know, they're just bad cases. These are. This is a bad disease. Here's another one where, you know, this angio was read as negative initially, and then they repeated it seven days later, and now look what you have. So they coiled it. And then it grew back. And, and then eventually they did treat it with a flow diverter and it did phenomenal after that. But it just, you know, it shows you we have options, but really what is our decision-making when there's no perfect answer? And so I'm just gonna go through the literature real quick. You know, and there's, we have a smattering of small case series. There's a, definitely a few meta-analysis and some comparing the various deep, uh, different modalities. I don't think we can draw conclusions concretely from any of them, but uh, you know, I'll give you my thoughts at the end. So here's a, a study from an Infantes group, and basically um, it's small numbers, but retrospective, but they achieved 87.5% complete occlusion with endovascular treatment, and they had 3% persistent filling. And that seems to be the issue with the endovascular treatment is you know the persistent filling and the the basospasm and dual antiplatelets, those are the, the, the main issues. Here's uh, another very small series using pipeline and you know they, they found 100% occlusion, but they had a 25% complication rate. And again, granted small um, uh, series. Um, this one is interesting because they were trying to use just a single antiplatelet versus dual antiplatelet. Again, generally small numbers, but the results were pretty good. And so it brings up the question, do we really need dual antiplatelets in this situation? Um, uh, this paper by Sclerati and so forth was the first big meta-analysis. Um, they looked at 32 studies, 684 patients. Endovascular methods were really the focus of this paper. And they had a 77% occlusion rate, about a 9% complication rate. You know, and MR, you know, good outcome to find MRS less than two, about 77% almost, and a 4.7% mortality. I'd say those numbers are pretty good considering what this disease is, really. Um, then we had this one, and, you know, this is a pretty good paper from uh, Jeremiah Johnson's group, where they looked at 102 studies. They had 687 surgical patients, 125 flow diverter patients, and then 700 or so other treatments. Um, and what they found was that uh, what we know, Surgical uh, treatment was most associated with intraop rupture, stroke, vasospasm, um, but it had the highest occlusion rate. And flow diverters seemed to have the lowest complication rate. Um, the highest retreatment and incomplete occlusion rate was stent coil and coil and all of those variations. And interestingly, there was no difference in functional outcome in, in the long term. So again, what do we do with this data? Um, here's another paper by the Smudas 
Um, you know, they looked at optimal treatment, mortality, outcome, rebleeding, recurrence. They had 117 in the surgical group, 173 in endovascular. Um, and again, they found no treatment was superior, but stent coiling and those type of endovascular therapies seem to be the ones associated with the highest need for retreatment. Uh, and then finally, this compilation of all the meta studies, basically comparing all of them. Again, mixed results, no consensus. There's superiority of microsurgery in terms of the definitiveness of the treatment, um, but there's less complications and less more periprocedural morbidity with endovascular therapies. Really flow diversion is when they're, what they're talking about here. Surgical option provided 90% occlusion rates. Trapping with bypass showed the best outcomes in the surgery groups. Um, and then the endovascular therapy, like we know, significant number of incomplete occlusions and need for retreatment. Um, so, you know, it's a trade-off one way or the other. So is there a best option? You know, I think this cartoon really sums it up best. Old faithful boom versus young and unreliable and, and less chance of an of a intra-procedural rupture. So, you know, to, to kind of sum it up and give you my thoughts, um, I don't think we have an optimal answer. I don't think there is an optimal treatment. And it's really going to boil down to the expertise of the center um, and their experience. For me, uh, our, at our institution, it's really age of the patient, grade, the hydrocephalus, need for an EBD, risk of vasospasm, summing all that up and deciding. And I tend to lean towards endovascular. I'd rather have them deal with it and put a flow diverter in if that's the best treatment for that specific scenario. Otherwise, you know, my experience, I've surgically clipped with the cotton and the wrapping and the hemoshield. I like that method. I will rely on bypass and trap when needed. Um, I may shift now based on what I'm reading in the, in the meta-analysis, um, but I've found that I've not needed to do bypass uh, in that setting with the hemorrhage and so forth. Um, and I've relied mostly on surgical clipping. But again, for me, I think flow diversion seems to be winning out as, as the primary treatment. And I'll go ahead and stop here. Thanks, Carlos. Excellent review. By the way, again, I remind the audience, don't be shy about writing your questions in the Q&A box, and we will uh, address that uh, at the end. Um, Okay, without uh, further discussion for now, Adam, uh, take us home with your presentation on retreatments. Okay, well, those were uh, two pretty tough acts to follow. Uh, are my slides showing up okay? Uh, yes, very good. Okay. Of note, I am the PI of Webit, and I'm going to talk about Web. Uh, I'm also, uh, and, I'm, and my employer's paid for that. I'm also PI of a, a study sponsored by Medtronic on treating ruptured blistered aneurysms with a uh, pipeline shield. So uh, that's something we can talk about later. But um, I'm gonna give a, a little brief background because I think to some extent, there's some overlap with what um, Chris talked about and what I talked about, because we're really talking about who we should treat and who we shouldn't. Um, and whatever your treatment in whatever situation, we've got to worry about beating the natural history. And I thought Chris's talk was great looking at natural history and, and uh, his uh, his decision analysis. He reviewed some of the literature on unruptured aneurysms. Um, and so I don't have to, which is great. I'm a lazy man and I prefer to let Chris do the hard work. Um, but but here's a patient with an unruptured uh, aneurysm. It's a little bit pedunculated. Um, uh, and and this is a, a case that we treated with, with straightforward coiling. So there's the aneurysm. Here's the, the initial coil, and here's the final result. So this is not a complete treatment. Um, there's clearly a neck, um, but at least in my practice, this is an example of somebody that I'm not going to bring back and retreat or flow divert over that neck as long as that maintains a stable uh, uh, position. I think this is the kind of patient that more and more in this day and age is undergoing multiple, multiple treatments to get a perfect angiographic result. And I think that's a little problematic looking at the literature. We know that most incidental aneurysms are not going to ru uh, rupture, but we're seeing them more and more and more. I had a colleague who calls patients who are referred for an incidentally described aneurysm victims of medical imaging technology, or vomit for short. Um, they come into clinic, they're terrified. As, as Chris mentioned, you really want to counsel these patients. They think they've got a ticking time bomb in their head. 
And, and you don't want to be this guy. Yeah, fear or anxiety is never uh, a, a good reason for a craniotomy to clip an aneurysm, in, in, in my opinion. Um, and I think in, in this day and age, um, we really have to be aware that if you're a cerebrovascular practitioner, either open or endovascular, your aneurysm patients come in two flavors. It's a bimodal peak. There are patients who come in with a ruptured aneurysm. And whether it's a bad rupture or it's a little rupture, those are patients who are in the ICU and they have real risks. They have risks of vasospasm, re-rupture, treatment-related risks. You talk to them and their patients differently. You view those risks differently. And then there are the patients who come into your clinic terrified. Uh, that Their primary care doctor, their neighbor, somebody's terrified them. You cannot conflate these two populations of patients. And I sometimes hear people conflate these two populations of patients. They have to be treated differently. They have to be thought of very differently. In terms of staged treatment, I think that that is a treatment which um, with flow diversion has become very feasible. So for a patient who has an aneurysm that you really think you want to dome protect with coil or web, and then come back later and flow divert a sidewall aneurysm, there's, there's literature, and this uh, out of Mayo is one of the best papers that indicates this is a very reasonable treatment. Now, I feel very different about terminus aneurysms. There's more and more off-label use of flow diverters to retreat terminus aneurysms. And although single center or multi-center uh, case series uh, show that they can do that, or, or you can do that in some cases, uh, it's not a, a really well-studied strategy. And I certainly have seen complications related to it. But here's an example from a case report in the literature of the kind of strategy I'm talking about. This is a ruptured PCOM aneurysm. Uh, it's fairly wide-necked. And after work, they were able to get it coiled to the point where it's probably not going to re-rupture in the immediate short term. Uh, I think the, the, the off-label use of an intrasacular flow disruptor is, is also possible in this case. Then they go back, in this case, in two weeks, and they, and they perfect that, that angiographic appearance of the flow diverter after the patient's out of the vasospasm window, out of the hydrocephalus window, this is increasingly a, a strategy that's pursued in many centers, and I think it's reasonable. Uh, I think um, you always should consider a single treatment. Could this patient have just had been clipped? Uh, certainly. Um, but, but in cases where the, the anatomy is complex or the patient's frail or very ill, I think this is a very reasonable stage treatment. What about the web? Well, the web could be used off-label in that case. Um, but the web results uh, do indicate that, that this is a device that can be used very quickly and efficiently without using any platelet agents, but there's a lot of recurrences. The question becomes, when should you treat uh, a recurrence? So uh, these data are not yet published, um, but we're working on them, and I presented them before. These are the, the, the five-year results of the Webbit study, and what you'll see right away is that there were retreatments in all five years, Right. Um, so there was a fairly significant retreatment rate in these 150 patients treated in a good clinical practices study with adjudicated data. The overall retreatment rate was about 15.5%. So um, we know that as aneurysms heal, the web gets distorted or modified, and this sometimes can result in uh, a perfect looking angiographic result as the dome of the aneurysm shrinks toward the neck. But in other cases, the, the web kind of gets scarred up and you end up with a neck remnant. So uh, I can show you some of the retreatments in Webbit. I can show you that the retreatment rate seems to be, although it's not statistically significant, higher for MCA aneurysms, which is interesting. As we look at more data and combine this, maybe that indicates that this is something that, that we need to pay attention to. Here's a, a Basler aneurysm that was treated at my center uh, within the Webbit study. Um, not an easy aneurysm to clip, certainly would require stent assistance without the web. And here's the web in place. Uh, it seems to be uh, uh, placed very well, but I wanna draw your attention to the right ventral portion of the aneurysm where there's clearly a chin or belly that is not being well covered by the web. What, what we see is that those cases are setups for a, a growing neck remnant. So is this patient protected from an acute rupture? Sure, the, the dome is protected. But here was a substantial recurrence that was treated with stent coiling. Um, you could argue that maybe this didn't need to be uh, retreated, um, but it was in this case. Here's a ruptured patient treated within the Webbit study. 
She had a, an ACOM aneurysm. Here's the web placed into the ACOM. I want to draw your attention again to the um, daughter sac that is uh, hanging down that is clearly not protected by the web, probably not the source of rupture. So maybe it doesn't need to be treated right off the bat, but this is a setup for a recurrence. And here you see the recurrence. Now that recurrence can be treated in a staged fashion. So maybe this wasn't a terrible result, but I think these are reasonable retreatments. I, I wanna point out that the two significant aneurysm related um, morbidities or mortalities in the five-year study are both, interestingly, patients who have very small, unruptured ACOM aneurysms that were treated, had small neck remnants that were retreated safely. But then in both cases, two different centers, the investigator embarked on a third treatment of a millimeter or two neck remnant of a four to six millimeter treated ACOM aneurysm. In one case, this resulted in, in a stent uh, occlusion and eventually rupture of an A1 and death. In the other case, there was a distal wire penetration. So I'm, I'm showing you the results here, a reasonable web result, six month follow-up and, and, and then five-year follow-up showed no worsening of the recurrence. Uh, a flow diverter was used in an off-label fashion in a terminus aneurysm. And then even after the flow diverter, there was still some filling. And so they went to do, just like in the other case, a third case and got a, a distal wire penetration that was eventually treated with liquid embolic and resulted in a significant stroke. So when should we be retreating these? Well, I, I, I think the two big questions are, when you're treating an unruptured aneurysm, once you've told the patient, I'm gonna treat your unruptured aneurysm, do you then have to continue to retreat and retreat and retreat until you get a perfect angiographic result? And then the second thing is, if you've treated a ruptured aneurysm and you end up with a small neck remnant, particularly after clipping, but even after coiling or web, are you committed to treating them again? And I think the literature tells you that the answer to both those questions is no. Here's a 55-year-old with a, a previously uh, ruptured aneurysm. Here are the carrot data on the rates of delayed rebleeding from intracranial aneurysms. They're extremely low. Once an aneurysm has been reasonably well treated, they're back to being unruptured aneurysms. Uh, the predictors of hemorrhage uh, are, are things like um, the person years and and the, and 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 whether you're dealing with a, a true dome residual or a residual neck. And residual necks, no matter how the aneurysm was initially treated are extraordinarily low risk of rupture. We see this in ISAT too. ISAT patients treated endovascular were only coiled. There wasn't any advanced stuff going on in that era. And whether it was coiled or clipped, even when there were neck remnants, there were very low rebleeding rates. So the carrot data indicate that for this relatively young 55 year old healthy woman who has a previously ruptured aneurysm, when there's a recurrent neck, the lifetime rupture risk for this patient is under 4%. And when you're dealing with a natural history risk that's under 4%, I would argue that probably in most centers that should not be retreated. What about growing aneurysms? Well, when aneurysms grow, there is evidence that they're higher risk. I, I like this paper in JAMA that, that is just in the last couple of years that looks at um, the, uh, the, 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 the various things that, that, that increase the risk. They look at the S's, so sight uh, and, and whether they're regular or irregular and size. So um, one of my uh, predecessors here at Sims Murphy was a phenomenal aneurysm surgeon named Morris Ray. And he once wrote a, a monograph called Thoughts While Shaving. Um, and, and all of us uh, who treat aneurysms have these moments, whether you're shaving or in the shower, when you think about these things. Um, I don't see a lot of unruptured pica aneurysms. And UCAS gives us almost no data on pica aneurysms. Uh, the rupture rate for distal uh, anterior cerebral artery aneurysms is much higher at a lower rate. I don't think a one size fits all approach to when it's safe to take a staged or a retreatment approach uh, is, is feasible. We have to deal with uncertainty and probability. But I, I can tell you that I really don't think that we should be um, embarking wholesale on retreatments uh, of, of small neck remnants of previously treated aneurysms, whether they were originally ruptured or not. Uh, I, I think we probably are doing that far too much, particularly in the United States. The web data show this. The retreatment rate in the U.S. for a webbed aneurysm is much higher than it is in Europe. 
Um, uh, other data are beginning to show this. Um, so I, I love being monolithic. I love giving you clear cut answers. Um, uh, in this case, where, where Jacques asked me to talk about um, whether retreatments and stage treatments uh, are a good idea, I'm going to have to be nuanced. I think when you look at an aneurysm, particularly in a frail or older patient, uh, somebody who's ruptured, and you can dome protect them and then give them a permanent treatment later, that's a very feasible strategy that ought to be considered for, for difficult or, or, or complex aneurysms. But I, on the other hand, uh, I think we're seeing far, far too many retreatments in this country, and we're probably hurting people in some cases more than we help them. Certainly in the five-year Webit data, uh, to, to, to see that the retreatment risk is actually infinitely higher than the risk of any of those patients having a rupture from their index aneurysm, it's humbling. Uh, we don't want to be more dangerous than the pathology that we're, we're trying to prevent. Uh, and in some cases, maybe we are. So I, uh, I thank you for your time and attention. I think I'm, I'm well under time, but that's good because like uh, Carlos and Chris, the, the most fun part of this is, is the conversation and the cases afterwards. Thanks, Adam. As always, uh, spectacular thoughts and, and putting together this complex literature and, and, and everything we've, we've read and we've all experienced. Um, you know, before we, I ask my our two fellows to present you cases, I think maybe this is a good time to answer the audience questions and maybe chat a little bit about things. But let me start off with this. Uh, aneurysms that are proven to grow, an aneurysm that was three millimeter, you follow it, it's five millimeter. Uh, Chris and, and uh, Adam, you both touched up on this. I mean, I'm aware of a couple of studies that uh, say that the risk of rupture becomes 12 to 20 times higher than the baseline and to me is a license to treat. Are we in agreement or, or not? Chris? So that is uh, some of the Japanese literature where they follow these lesions very uh, carefully and find that. And of course, what happens is when one of these things gets larger, and the first thing to be is to, is to check, and I think AI may help this, did it really get bigger? Right. So, you know, the cursor in the radiology suite was laid one pixel bigger. And the next thing, you know, it's, it's said to be four instead of three. That right. is trivial. And we can often prove to the patient by going over the films with it that it hasn't really changed in shape or size. But it's the four millimeter or three millimeters and becomes a six millimeter aneurysm. Then everyone gets nervous, including the patient. And and I think you're in in pretty good standing to recommend treatment for that lesion if you can do it low risk. Uh, Adam, do you, do you use the growth as a definite indication to treat or not? Definite growth is definitely associated with a higher risk of rupture. But, but like Chris, most of the patients referred to me with definite growth have not had growth. They've right. had a radiologist interpret it differently. And, and I've been in conferences where people use that as a justification to treat the patient, and I don't agree with that. Carlos, any different thoughts? Well, ditto. You know, I, 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 honestly, I, I remember when um, Brian Ho asked for any potential aneurysms, he was doing a study, and I went back through every single one that we had seen at Leahy over like a 10-year period not a single one had shown growth. So it, it's almost like that that mythic uh, unicorn. I'm not sure it really exists except in very, very rare circumstances. So Chuck, that raises the question, how often should these people really be screened? And as you know, this has been an interest of mine. We did a cost effectiveness analysis and came up with two years. But, you know, I've met patients who are getting scans every six months with a three millimeter aneurysm. And I'm like, what is going on here? And realize, you know, this has bigger implications for healthcare and health dollars. But, but as Carlos said, the number you see change over time is so small, you really wonder how often these patients should really be screened. Yeah, I'll raise another specter. So now we have artificial intelligence companies that are giving you products where it can look at all CTAs done in a system and ping you anytime it detects an aneurysm, no matter what the size is. Um, when, when they asked me on, uh, about my opinion about these products, I said, you're going to hurt more people than you're going to help um, because of the aggression. So 
I think webinars like this, where we get people together, it's important to be clear on our culture. I know the ABNS is very serious about looking at post logs for, for, for people who are treating patients without indication. Um, we, we, we are going to have to kind of develop a culture of, of being real about what the indications for elective treatment of aneurysms are. And, and obviously, growth is, is, is one uh, metric, but uh, I think we need to be real about um, with more endovascular has come more unindicated treatments. And Adam, not only will you get pinged that there's an aneurysm that exists, it'll ping you as to when you should do the next scan. That's <laughs> the next, it, it'll say do a scan in 1.3 years or 1.5 years. Yeah, it's it's coming. I mean, it's, it's okay. here. Uh, Chris, I remember, I don't know how many years ago you wrote a paper, you suggested a score of, I think, I think 10 or 11 score categories to predict recanalization of aneurysms. What was it called? So that was, uh, there was no name, but it was, uh, it was actually a multi-center study of 1500 endovascularly treated aneurysms. And it incorporated um, the completeness. So it, it looked at size, hemorrhage, no hemorrhage, uh, and then how it was treated right. and completeness of treatment. And based on that, we could stratify risk of recanalization. And in fact, we had enough at the time uh, pipeline treated patients that we included endovascular treatment into that. And the point is, you know, a five millimeter or an eight mil, seven millimeter, really well coiled, tightly coiled aneurysm like Adam showed in the periclinoid location, um, uh, completely coiled, the side wall that the risk of that recanalizing is significantly different than the carotid bifurcation aneurysm that's 10 millimeters and grade two, Raymond Roy grade two coiling. And that, and, and it really, you can show that quite statistically. And so the big factors are size of aneurysm, thrombus, uh, hemorrhage, no hemorrhage, and then treatment modality um, uh, in terms of, this was all endovascular, completeness yeah. of treatment with coils, and then adding stent to coils significantly reduces recan rates and flow diversion. Right, but I remember, I wish I had the paper, uh, I, because I've used a graph in your, in your paper to say, because in the top six or seven categories, the recanalization rate was so high. I said, well, this is data that must justify clipping those cases if the data suggests that the recanalization rate is so high, at least in those higher risk groups. Correct. The, the correct. S, wasn't it? Uh, correct. The uh, the large ruptured aneurysms, the giants, uh, especially if they have thrombus, you got about like a ninety to hundred percent chance you're going to be retreating right. that aneurysm. Right. Right. And we used retreatment as a surrogate for recan. Correct. And and Adam, just quick question: You had mentioned uh, growing neck remnant when with the with the web device. Did you mean growing neck remnant or com compaction of the device? Yeah, well, actual, you know, because growth is different than compaction, right? Right, but it can be hard to tell, right? Um, uh, because the device is obviously different than a clip, and it's different than coils. It's compressible. So, in the two cases I showed that were retreated, the ruptured acom and the unruptured basilar, there was clearly a growth in the remnant that had not been treated originally. You know, the aneurysm healed where the web was, but where the web wasn't, it's not going to go away, and it might even grow a little bit uh, over over the initial placement. So that, that's what I meant. Okay, uh, let's uh, tackle some audience questions. Um, uh, Albert Allen is delighted to be seeing Carlos David. Uh, Carlos, he's misguided into thinking you're a good guy, but anyway, he sends you his best. He Thank remembers. you, Albert. <laughs> uh, and then I think he's asking whole blood transcriptome biomarkers of unruptured intracranial aneurysm, future blood test for early detection, question mark. And maybe if I could also invite my partner, Bobby, to weigh into those uh, conversations as well, if he's not called back to the angel suite. Um, any, anybody wants to chime in? Is this, uh, will, be, will somebody be watching this webinar of today and laughing at us and saying, oh, look, they were in the stone age looking at linear diameter of an aneurysm um anybody no blood tests to predict uh, rupture rate uh, i i think imaging is going to be far more sophisticated than whether vessel wall imaging is going to work out with a 7t magnet 
we're in a study with that now. Uh, but as you as you probably know, there are blood tests being developed. The group in uh, Buffalo is working hard on this. Right. Um, and uh, uh, actually, the company was started by a patient whose wife, the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage was missed and she died. Uh, so he's funding this with great interest. And, but I think it may come up to be a, a sort of a multifaceted evaluation uh, and using all the parameters, you know. But it's important to know that this is experimental. Um, it'd be great if it came out. And, and Frank, totally. Chris, vessel wall imaging, right? You probably at this point, you'd have to say that's experimental, but promising. I mean, the totally, totally experimental. Absolutely. And yeah. a lot of people are doing it and they don't know what to do with the data. Right. Yeah, I mean, car currently we're collecting blood, tissue, cells from a lot of patients in, in an effort, you know, to, and also collaborating with a number of other centers to try and develop you know, a, t a, a diagnostic test, a medical therapy, improved cellular and molecular based imaging, but, um, you know, still, still ways to go for sure. Uh, Ahmad Najjar would like to know if there is any long-term data on blister aneurysms, uh, I guess, Carlos, what can you tell him about what you reviewed and your experience? Yeah, you know, the, all those meta-analysis and the individual papers, the the, the follow-ups were some as long as nine years. So I think that is the follow-up, the long-term follow-up data. It seems like 77-ish percent of patients do well um, with flow diversion um, with, you know, relatively low morbidity and mortality in the four or five percent range. So I, I will argue with that because that literature is entirely based on self-adjudicated, self-reported studies. And every disease we look at, when you when you really do a scientific study, there's a gap of usually around 20%. So we, we are doing the first adjudicated study on blister aneurysms. It's a multi-center study called Elevate. Uh, it's phosphorocholine coated um, flow diverters and three days of dual antiplatelets and then single antiplate with aspirin. I predict that um, uh, that study, which is sponsored by Medtronic, is going to show much worse uh, long-term numbers. Uh, certainly, I mean, maybe it's just that I'm terrible at treating blister patients. Um, I, I, I'm, in my personal case series over 18 years, uh, it's not, you know, 77% are doing great. Uh, that's, uh, uh, like yeah. I, said, I see a lot of young women, horrible vasospasm, um, you know, and, and, and systemic illness. That's the other thing that Carlos, you didn't mention, I find that patients with ruptured blister aneurysms are extremely creative about finding ways to get sick and die in the ICU. I've seen <laughs> um, pulmonary complications. I've seen bleeding complications. I've seen Takasubo's cardiomyopathy. Um, you know, it, it isn't always re-rupture the aneurysm. It seems like th th they're, they're just really uh, ill. And, and is this just, just, just in Memphis, oh, or they are. <laughs> okay. they are. I told you that that CFO that I treated. You know, I'm shocked that he survived and actually did well in the long run. But he was at that store. We almost didn't treat him at all. They're really bad grade subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. And and you know that I'm telling you the literature that is out there. But that's why I prefaced it all by saying, what, what's the decision making when you don't have good data or a good answer? We really do need some randomized trials. You know, when I first, I've sort of morphed to, to flow diversion if possible for these lesions. And when I first started doing it, the first couple of patients, I was angioing every five days to a week and there the lesion was and the patient was sick. And so finally, I talked to the group at Jeff at Jefferson who had done, who had published a series of them. And they said, don't look, <laughs> just leave them, look in a month. And sure enough, you know, then the thing's gone, but the th it takes a while and they can look pretty bad for a while. It makes you very nervous that they're on dual antiplatelets. Hurting your eyes more than the patient. We definitely had some that the blister looked, that we pipelined or a flow diverted that looked better at a one week when they have spasm. And we repeated at two weeks and the aneurysm had grown significantly. And all of those ones we, you know, by then they're, they're past most of the issues. And then we, we flow divert them again. I agree with Dr. Arthur. You know, I think most of these patients probably have some molecular problem and they all seem to get severe vasospasm. They tend to have more Takasubos. And I bet there's some molecular or genetic, you know, trait that a lot of them share that we haven't figured out yet. Okay. Yeah, but but oh, those of us who have tried to clip wrap them or sunt clip them, uh, it's interesting. A almost all of us are, are happy to, to, to see flow diverters, you know? I mean, I, I was with Gary Steinberg uh, from Stanford this week. 
And and man, nobody loves clipping an aneurysm more than Gary. Uh, and blister aneurysms came up, and he said, "No, I don't like those. I, I want the endovascular guys to do all of those. I don't want to do those." Uh, so it, it it scars you. Um, uh, I think the younger guys who 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 haven't done two dozen blister aneurysms. Uh, Maybe maybe haven't uh, had the psycho psychological trauma that, that that some of us have gone through, and, well, and the sun clips were, uh, you know, they were great for the surgeon because they stopped the bleeding. But about a third of those patients had carotid occlusions, and happily, most of those were asymptomatic. But I've looked at some angios of the, or there's a trickle of flow through them. I have two patients like that, and one that's occluded, but they had good collateral. So we thought, oh great, they got through it. They're moving everything. They did well, but that was the downside. Well, that's where the flow probe and 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 trapping, you know, gets gets you know useful too, right? I mean, Carlos was showing that, but I know Jacques uh, likes using the flow probe, and and for a blister aneurysm, that that can be very useful. And ICG, you're right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, uh, uh, dumping things on endovascular people isn't limited to aneurysms, and as, as you know, that's why Carl Heilman is working on his eshunt. He wants all the endovascular people to place that little E shunt and be done with this uh, shunts for NPH and pseudo tumor. Uh, and subarachnoid, well, subarachnoid hemorrhage, we just put to IRB subarachnoid hemorrhage for the E shunt. Right. Been, oh. I think seven patients have been treated with the E shunt for subarachnoid. Oh, really? Okay. For you, those of you who don't know the seed story behind that, he was doing a shunt revision at two in the morning on one of Adel Malik's patients. And he said, hell, if they're going to take and treat the aneurysm, they might as well figure out a way to treat the shunt. And he started talking and that's, that's how it came about. Okay, uh, Ahmad Najjar, another question. What is the risk of rupture of an ACOM aneurysm of two millimeter in a 10 year old kid? Um, Chris, uh, talk, uh, talking about, well, you can, I don't know if you want to answer it specifically. Uh, can you allude to the genetic difference in natural history, the Finnish, the Japanese, the North American? Why is the ACOM higher in Japanese rupture risk than it is in US? And just talk about this. As, as, as you know, th there's not an obvious, obvious answer to that. The yeah. other thing in this sort of buried in this question is the aneurysm in a child versus the aneurysm in a 70 year old. And these are, if it's a real aneurysm, first of all, it was found for some odd reason uh, because, you know, why is a kid getting scanned or studied? Um, uh, but as, as everyone here knows, the, the pediatric aneurysm is often a different animal with, you know, more fusiform involvement of vessels and, and nasty. I don't know what the actual <laughs> long life project. I mean, you could use the numbers and calculate the life projection of a right. risk of rupture for a two millimeter aneurysm. There is a number, but I think that's a patient that would be followed radiographically. And I bet if it grew, that would be very aggressively treated. And uh, Khaled Asi would like to ask, would you guys treat an enlarging asymptomatic cavernous aneurysm, carotid cavernous aneurysm? I would not, but whatever. Devil's in the details, right? Um, you know, many of the cavernous aneurysms I see are in little old ladies. And, uh, you know, obviously there's no risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I think those can often be left alone. You know, enlarging, I mean, is it like we were talking about? It was three millimeters and then a radiologist read it as four millimeters. Uh, even in a young patient, I wouldn't. But I think in general, cavernous aneurysms can be safely left alone. Alex Berenstein's group did a great paper on that, even when they become symptomatic. Uh, the, uh, the symptomatic aneurysms in the cavernous uh, segment that that Alex's group followed, some of them would get symptomatic and then become asymptomatic again. So obviously, extradural aneurysms are a different thing. Yeah, but the problem, Adam, is as... as uh, Chris talked about earlier, what is said is not what is done. I mean, uh, we all see in our practices, you remember that paper decades ago, it was called the rape of the spine. And now there is really a similar trend of, I don't know what we're going to call it, but this abuse of treating those bitzels. Even I love that you're mentioning JT Robertson's address, the rape of the spine when you're here. Oh, was that, oh that's right. That was his, that's right. JT. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I I mean uh, glass half full, glass half empty. We we yeah. we happen to be in one of the only fields that is actually looking at indications in the first year in practice. 
right? I saw a cardiologist when I was way, on my way back from the ABNS and I told him what we were doing. And he said, wait a minute, you actually look at their cases? And I said, yes. He said, hell, if we did that in cardiology, we, we, uh, we, we'd take away the boards for half the cardiologists in the United States. So, I mean, we, we do have a culture where we, we are talking about these things and trying to, to hold each other to a better standard. But yeah, you're right, Jacques. Uh, endovascular is the new spine. Um, question from Ali Habaza. Uh, great presentations. What? When do you guys add coils to a flow diverter in an unruptured aneurysm? Is general guidelines. Chris, I, I tell you, I, I used to put coils in the giant aneurysms with flow diversion, and now it's pretty rare. Uh, maybe Bobby has a perspective on that. But you know, flow diversion is the efficacy is so high without coils, uh, and it, and it's particularly if the patient has a mass effect. We've had such good luck of that once they get through the swelling and the aneurysm thrombosing that I, I really rarely use coils with a flow diverter. Any other opinion on that? There was a, a multi-center study uh, put together at the University of Alabama that they never published trying to find the threshold. And their data suggested that uh, the threshold um, might be somewhere around 14 millimeters in size. Um, but this business of uh, flow diverted aneurysms rupturing acutely has really almost never been um, reported for, for non-giant or certainly smaller than 14 millimeter aneurysms. So I don't know, Chris, that you have to do it at all but you certainly don't have to do it for, for small and medium aneurysms, in, in my opinion. I don't know, Bobby, you have a different opinion? Uh, yeah, someone else published a paper showing that if you use coils, you know, even when controlling for size and multivariate analysis, the obliteration rate goes up slightly, but the um, complication rate slightly goes up as well, which in my mind makes perfect sense. You know, you might be making the procedure a little bit more uh, complicated, but you know, even just putting a couple of loose coils in there will increase the chances that it obliterates. So I do still put, you know, a loose coiling in a lot of my aneurysms, especially the, the really giant ones. Um, and then if I don't put coils in, I usually do one flow diverting stent. And if I don't see contrast stasis in the aneurysm, usually I'll place another one. Um, I mean, I think that's the other controversial thing that we talked about when you go back to when we first started doing this, whenever it was like, and, you know, nine, 10 years ago, originally we were placing like four flow diverting stents in every aneurysm, but they were giant. Then we moved all the way to the other end of the spectrum, just doing one flow diverting stent. And now I think a lot of times if it's not necessarily for giant, it's usually one to two flow diverting stents. It, it is interesting. We looked at uh, flow stagnation after flow diversion and it, it, it did not correlate with aneurysm obliteration. You know, it was, it stagnated at the same chance of obliterating of the, the non-stagnants, but it, it's something that might merit re-evaluation now that so many, that was early on in our experience though. Yeah, maybe, you know, we can look at it in the larger database now, but it seems like in the larger databases, those that have some stagnation or have a higher chance of obliterating. Okay, uh, one, one last question before we present the two cases. Uh, What's your preference for uh, from Edinson Najera? What's your preference for flow diversion type in blister-like aneurysms? Uh, I, any difference in efficacy and safety? Have you seen stenosis of the parent artery in long term? I assume Edinson is asking about, about which type of flow diverter, pipeline versus others. Anybody would like to tackle this question? Well, the pipeline shield is a surface modified flow diverter that has phosphocholine on it in an attempt to reju reduce thrombogenicity. And so um, I think uh, as we go down that road, um, pipeline shield and then other stents that are coming that, that have some surface modification might, might be um, a good choice. Uh, because obviously a lot of these patients require ventriculostomies and and there are, are bleeding complications. So if we could do it without, you know, dousing everybody in, in heavy dual antiplatelets, uh, I, I think that would be preferable. Um, I'm not aware of any data that suggests that one brand or another is better in this specialized application, but, you know, um, surface modification is interesting. Okay, Matt, uh, Matt, my uh, current uh, ex uh, external fellow, 
why don't we have you present the case you've prepared? All right, so this is a case that uh, Dr. Marcos and Dr. Stark uh, were both involved in. Uh, so the case is a 40-year-old female who three years ago underwent a left terrional craniotomy for resection of a paraclinoid meningioma, who preoperatively did not have any aneurysms, but um, post-op serial imaging was actually found to have a growing left MC aneurysm. On exam, she had actually decreased left eye vision from before the initial tumor resection, and otherwise um, she is neurologically intact. So here is the MRI of the original tumor before the first surgery. And if you look at the pre-op T2 and the post-op T2, it's pretty clean pre-op, but already on the post-op T2, there may be something suspicious at the MCA bifurcation. Uh, Matt, for the audience, uh, just if, if you use your pointer, show them what we're talking of course. about. Yes. And, so, and where it wasn't before. Right. So how far post-op was that, Matt? This is within one week post-op the immediate post-op MRI. This is, uh, Chris, another partner of ours. I didn't do the first surgery. We asked him, they never had any problem with the MCA. He split the sylvian fissure, took the clinoidal meningioma out, never encountered any bleeding. Um, and, uh, you know, very puzzling. Uh, here, go ahead, Matt, show the before. Yeah, you. and then here on the post-op, you know, there's something suspicious already at the MCA bifurcation. And, um, and of course the patient had multiple MRIs to track the tumor. And uh, initially the MRI post-op, even the three month post-op MRI, um, the radiologist did not call an aneurysm uh, being present, but by the eight month post-op MRI, the radiologist was able to pick up the aneurysm and you can see by 20 months, it, it becomes more apparent and I'll show you more. So you can see a little bit better on the T2 sequences, eight months and then 20 months. It, it's definitely grown. And, um, and I'll show you another sequence um, here, two years post-op, now it's bigger. And you can see it definitely on the MRA. And so this is when this patient was referred to the cerebrovascular clinic and uh, we did a angiogram and the measurement was 7.1 millimeters at its largest dimension. And if you look more carefully, this is a, and I'll show you the 3D here. Um, oh, by the way, so the, uh, the ECA injection shows a small frontal branch of the STA without a uh, obvious parietal branch seen on that side. So here's the 3D spin. You can see this is actually an MCA trifurcation where there is a temporal M2 that comes Matt, out. Sorry, yeah, with your pointer, show inflow and outflow for the audience. Yeah, so here it's a little bit easier to see. Here's M1 inflow aneurysm neck here, aneurysm dome away from us. Here's a temporal M2 where the origin of the temporal M2 is just proximal to the sort of the true neck of the aneurysm. And then there are two frontal M2 branches that sort of come out of the aneurysm. And here is the more direct view. So now you're looking at the sort of the temp, uh, M1 here, oh, sorry, M1 coming this way and then temporal M2 here, and then the two frontal M2s. Yeah, just, uh, just Bobby, you want to comment? You did the angiogram. Yeah, just to, and just to be clear, I mean, because I think it's, it's very hard unless you really study these images. There is a pipe of an M2 that comes out of the- Bobby, middle. You're, too, you're too far from the microphone. Your, your voice is not clear. Sorry about that. So there is a pipe of an M2 that comes out of the middle of the aneurysm dome. There's one M2 that looks normal that comes out of the base, but the third M2 also, it's not really coming out of the base. It's coming out of 
sort of the lateral part of the, of the aneurysm. So it's a little hard to see that here, but basically there's two M2s that are not coming out of the base whatsoever. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah. And um, so the question for our speakers today is, um, how would you manage or treat this aneurysm? And I can go back to this slide here. And, and actually, even more importantly, how do you make sense of the pathogenesis of this aneurysm? I mean, all of us who've had pseudo aneurysm or aneurysm, I mean, you know, you always get bleeding at the time of the initial quote unquote injury. Um, comments on? Uh... So, so we're absolutely sure on other images it was not there pre op. Absolutely certain. I, yeah. We, I, we so there went was. Over it. So a week later, I think you have to. Even though there was no encountered bleeding, you wonder if there was a retractor, if there was stretch on the vessel and you created some intimal, you know, a little bruising of the vessel wall, it didn't bleed and then subsequently developed. Yeah. Okay, comments on treatment? Well, I guess growing aneurysm, natural. Chris, you're our natural. Well, this is, this is not, uh, I don't think this is a, standard saccular you know congenital aneurysm i'm jock your comments earlier like we asked the surgeon and carlos's comments so it makes us all very and the fact that we see it 10 days after surgery makes us all a little suspicious that it's a traumatic pseudo aneurysm and um uh, of course i've seen these types of things when after transphenoidal surgery you know sometimes a few years later that are growing there pretty straightforward to treat because you can use flow diversion through the cavernous carotid or supraclinoid carotid. This is obviously more difficult because of the branches coming out of it, which may necessitate uh, bypasses of one or two of those branches um, and occlusion of the lesion. Because I don't think a, a direct clipping is going to, it'd be a tricky reconstruction to, to uh, include those branches and not leave bad artery in the, uh, in the construct. Okay, Adam, at endovascular options. So, um, you know, Bobby's saying that there are two branches that come out of the aneurysm. I, I have to admit, having not had the opportunity to study it, I thought maybe we could stenosis coil, but he, he specified there's two branches, which means you'd have to do some kind of a, you know, Y stent construct. Um, but I, I think stenosisted coiling is where you're stuck with. I don't, I don't think a straight coiling is going to work. I don't think flow diversion's uh, a great idea. Um, I, this may be an aneurysm that's better treated with open surgery and, and, and possible bypass. If you only got one STA branch, you know, you could see how long you could get it and, and do sort of a one donor, two recipients, uh, approach if you need to go to both of those branches, or maybe you can bypass one branch and clip reconstruct the aneurysm into the other branch. Carlos. So I'm looking at that, I, you know, I think you could probably bypass to that one that's coming out of the dome. And honestly, I think you could probably clip reconstruct the rest of it and maybe augment with some cotton, but uh, I'm not sure, you, or you could rely on your favorite new bypass doing the two vessels with one. Um, but in my hands, I'd probably try to clip reconstruct with bypass just to that one that's under risk. Okay. Um, Matt, go ahead. And I think, and we discussed it at like as a team, it's a little hard to see from those pictures. You know, it, it, and when I was thinking about it for antivascular options, trying to come up with something that you could do with a stent or three balloons and then stent whichever ones you need to. But one of those branches comes out of the middle of the dome. So whenever I think something's going to need two bypasses, because there's two limbs there that I can figure out how it's going to clip. You know, especially in someone who's young, that's usually someone I like to uh, involve um, my partners to discuss, and especially Dr. Heroes and Dr. Marcos. Matt, you want to go yeah, over? So, yeah. These options, I, I think our speakers already mentioned, you know, it, it's not going to be simple coiling or simple clipping, whether we go endovascular or microsurgical options. And um, you know, it warrants, um, you know, oftentimes multi-surgeon discussion, you know, um, stent assisted or balloon assisted coiling, or even pulse rider assisted coiling. And I think bypass if uh, microsurgical option bypass is most likely necessary. Um, it would be difficult to just clip it without, um, you know, allowing flow through, especially the big one that comes out of the dome of the aneurysm. And so, uh, what we, did was we actually prepared this patient for 
uh, an ECIC bypass uh, with a radio artery graft. Um, but what we were able to achieve in the end was actually a, a, a craniotomy with a temporal M2, one donor, two recipient to each of the frontal M2s that um, came out of the aneurysm. Uh, so a double bypass with just one donor and, uh, and then clip, uh, clipping of the aneurysm. So I'll show you the video briefly. Um, I'm gonna fast forward through some of this. So um, after a Sylvan Fisher dissection, you can see the aneurysm uh, actually you know, pretty uh, superficial. Uh, and um, initially we are doing kind of a combination of uh, rachmo dissection and sometimes necessitating uh, cordycectomies both on the frontal and the temporal lobe side just because of uh, prior surgery. And um, then we went ahead and uh, looked for the M1. And I think and what's deep. impressive there, which maybe it's hard to see, is like this aneurysm is entirely stuck to the, to the bone and the dura all the way anteriorly where the craniotomy site was. So I think it must have been, you know, from the prior surgery. It was, it was completely stuck. Exactly. Here you're seeing one of the M2s. Here's the other M2. These two are like, these are two of the frontal M2s. And then the one on the left of the screen, that's the temporal M2, whose origin is just proximal to the neck of the aneurysm. So we're measuring flow. And I believe the temporal M2 was 15. The two other frontal M2s are 20 and mid to high 20s. And uh, after looking at this, uh, we felt that it was actually possible to do a, a one donor, two recipient bypass where the first one that we did was screen left here, temporal M2, uh, side to side bypass to the bigger M2, which comes out of the dome of the aneurysm. And, uh, and so here we're first suturing the back wall of the aneurysm, I'm sorry, by the back wall of the bypass. with a running technique. And then after that, checking for luminal patency to make sure we didn't grab any other walls and then interrupt it for the frontal side. Here's the last stitch. And here's uh, what it looks like after the side to side bypass. And we use flow measurement to make sure that it's patent. And at one point we even put a clip proximally to the recipient and saw that the flow actually increased when we obviously occluded the proximal, the inflow of this uh, recipient M2. And so the next thing was to prepare the second M, uh, frontal M2, the second recipient uh, for bypass. And here we're dissecting a, a, a more distal branch of the temporal M2 and uh, to do a uh, end to side bypass. Here we're kind of pulling this distal branch out and then swinging it to the frontal side to do a end to side bypass. We're fish mouthing the donor here. You can go a little faster, yeah. Matt, just for the sake yeah. of time. Yeah, so I'm gonna just kind of skip through the bypass itself, interrupted sutures. And then we began to the final aneurysm dissection to prepare for clipping. Uh, we put a temporary clip on M1 to soften the aneurysm for safer dissection. And uh, to allow better manipulation of the aneurysm, we clipped and then cut off the stump of the frontal M2 that had already gotten the bypass. And uh, then we also did the same thing for the other uh, frontal M2 that got the end to side bypass there. So now we can really manipulate the aneurysm more freely 
you know, the more yeah. you dissected this thing, the more it really looked so stuck. And it, uh, in retrospect, it must be a dissection, a traumatic dissection that grew over time. It was so difficult to develop a plane around it. Exactly. And, uh, and, and we, we tried our best to dissect the temporal M2 off the aneurysm wall, and it, it was completely stuck, as you can see here. And so the first clip that we tried was basically to clip the side of the aneurysm tangential, right here, tangential to the temporal M2 without stenosing uh, the origin of it which is on the back end of the uh, aneurysm neck on the M1 side. And uh, after we clipped it, you can see the origin of the temporal M2 is still patent. And then for the rest of the aneurysm, I'm just gonna fast forward here. Um, we first removed those two clips that were in the way that were clamping the stumps of the two M2s and tried a angled clip and even this was, we felt it was not optimal. So then we decided to bipolar shrink it to make it more clippable so that eventually we were able to put this angled clip on the aneurysm. And then when we examined this, there's a small gap here, uh, even after we adjusted the angle clip. And so we first tried a mini clip and um, didn't exactly fill the gap. So we put a bigger uh, regular size clip to fill that gap or to close that gap. And this is what it looks like in the end. So uh, yeah. I'm going to, go ahead. Sorry, a yeah, question though. You know, obviously it wasn't there a week later, it's there post up. Why? not treated originally why wait and watch this it, it wasn't seen uh, it wasn't seen we we got involved whatever a year and a half later or something uh -huh. and it wasn't it wasn't picked it wasn't noted by radiology as well it wasn't until we i looked back at the films you could see that it had been progressively okay. growing the whole time yeah too bad because it would have been probably a lot easier to deal with oh boy yes it would matt is this a yeah so this is the post-op angio and you can see there's no residual aneurysm seen and the bypasses are hidden. I'll show you the 3D reconstruction next. Uh, you can see the clips and the bypasses there. Yeah, we never needed the radial artery, but it was nice to know, you know, that it was there. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, it's a beautiful job, Jacques. It's a, it's a beautiful job. And I was gonna ask you about the radial artery. Did you harvest it? We did. Yeah. We did. And have you gotten I, away from saphenous vein altogether? Almost. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, I haven't used the saphenous vein in many years. We used to do okay. them endoscopic harvesting. Right. Endoscopic. Right. We would do it with the cardiac folks and they'd, uh, har yeah. they'd harvest it while we prepare the aneurysm. Exactly. To be honest, with flow measurements, you get more courage into using STAs. STAs are you know, should as again, but, but his STA was not good. Oh, yeah, no, you his know, STA because of the yeah. previous surgery. That's the problem, you correct, know, correct. That's why we, and you know, and then the availability of the person doing the radial artery, you don't want them waiting hours to know if you know, what I mean, so we had to take it and never used it. I didn't understand the logistics and and uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it factors yeah. into what we do, you know. Yeah. So we thought this is an interesting case on pathology, I mean, pathogenesis and, and management. So thanks, Matt, for this nice presentation. And if I can go to Eva. Eva, are you ready to yep. show your case? Talking yeah. about, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this is, we actually have two cases. So the first one is a 46-year-old woman who um, presented to an outside hospital with thunderclap headache. And so then she was, uh, you know, they got a CT, then they transferred her to us for evaluation. And so on exam, she was somnolent, but easily arousable, otherwise intact. And so here was her CC or her CT with a diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage and hydro. And so we ended up, you know, getting a CTA, uh, angio. And so this is what we um, saw on the angiogram. And so just wanted to, you know, have the panelists describe to, you know, just the audience what they see. 
So, Adam, what is it? It's a ruptured dorsal carotid blister aneurysm. It looks like the ones that Carlos showed. I think for trainees, you know, it's very important to look for these. Um, classically, they're on the opposite side of the artery from the PCOM and anterior choroidal takeoff, and it looks like that's probably what we're dealing with here. They they tend, whereas saccular aneurysms tend to follow Roten's rules and, 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 and occur just past a branch, these are on a, a section of artery that doesn't have a branch, and rather than being saccular with a Murphy's tit on them, they look like a, a, a cone or volcano, uh, and then they can rapidly expand, and if you don't catch them right off the bat, they can look more like a saccular aneurysm, but um, I think this is the the classic. And a persistent trigeminal artery, Jacques. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Which which increases the chance of saccular aneurysms, but I'm not aware of any association with persistent fetal circulation and and DCBAs. Um, maybe just you know. Uh, yeah, I wasn't either. I assume it's a coincidence. Uh, Bobby, do we need, do we have reasons to believe this is more than a coincidence, blister and persistent trigeminal and fetal PCOM? I think like, like you said, that there's a, a higher incidence of aneurysm, but I don't know if we see a higher incidence of blister. Yeah. Okay. Eva, go. Oh, so I guess what, what's your next slide, Eva? Okay. Oh, just, uh, you know, how they would manage the uh, patient. W well, the panel, I think, decided today yeah. it should be endovascular first uh, uh, chance of refusal. Mm -hmm. I assume that's what the panel will say. So I'm going to well, say endovascular that. flow diverter. Not yes, of course. And coil or all the other options you have listed there. Those I'm sure to be inferior. And from us, you know, I would send my I would send it to my endovascular colleague for flow diversion. And if not an issue, if it is an issue for them, then I think. This is, looks small enough that probably just clipping with cotton would do it. Is, is that fetal um, directly opposite the aneurysm? Sorry. Is that a fetal PCOM without a P1 that's directly opposite yeah. the blister? Uh, yes, slightly. Yes, yes, it is. Does that change everybody's notion of? You mean about surgical wrapping? Uh, I, I, I don't know, Bobby, how you're thinking about these, but but not really. You know, basically with the flow diverters, I think if if a vessel needs to stay open, it stays open. If there's good collateral, it can it can uh, go away asymptomatically. Is pretty much what we found. We become uh, respectful of that possibility, but but uh, I think I would still treat this with with flow diversion. The Elevate protocol we've developed um, uh, based on the Australian experience with the phosphorocholine um, coated stents is really not to give heparin or, or any antiplatelets until you drop the flow diverter. And then right at the time of dropping, we give uh, uh, Integralin or, or another IV agent. And then three days of uh, ticagrelor and aspirin and then only aspirin. And, and what I like about that is that if you have EVD issues, you can deal with it because Tecagrel is very quick on and off. I have a little bit of a, a preference towards double or triple covering. You know, if you if you put a, a, a given size flow diverter in and then for your next one, go a quarter millimeter larger in size, you're going to get a different braid angle. And, and so, you know, at least theoretically in my head, I feel like, okay, well, maybe there's better coverage there than if you just put one stent in or... Or, or the same size in twice. I was going to ask if, if if anyone would use more than one flow diverter at the initial treatment, because I've I've sort of headed there. Adam, one question for the study: How many patients are going to be entered in that, and what's the time course for that? Because these are so rare, you know, it, to prospectively collect, it's going to take a little bit of time, huh? Yeah, it, it 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 could be an issue. I mean, it's a sponsored study. Again, thank you, Medtronic, for letting us study a. A difficult to treat and and morbid patient population, um, but um, uh, it, it's probably going to take several years. Um, our our hope is that that we'll get you know good adjudicated data uh, out of it. Um, but you know, heck, the results may be so terrible that we're going to be at this webinar uh, you know in another year or two and talking about how well based on the Elevate study we need to um, clip wrap uh, every ruptured dorsal carotid blister aneurysm because. I do believe they're going to be worse results than what Carlos um, uh, reported in the existing self-reported literature. 
Adam, just for knowledge, um, what's your recipe, assuming, let's say, two weeks later, she needs a shunt? What do you do? Well, at this point, they're just on aspirin at two weeks with, with this protocol. So I would shunt them on aspirin. Okay. So the reason I brought up that fetal is because I think one, just in regards to your your two comments, I don't think one float over has any chance of, of making this go away if it's directly opposite the blister because they're that that's going to be disease. So I would say you're going to need at least two up front, and I would say there's a good chance you're going to need to come back and place another one down the road. And then just in regards to the shunt, a lot of times we just um, take the person to the OR, cut the EVD, and then open the incision and, and put the valve in. So you're not repassing another EVD through the brain on aspirin and flavin. Yeah. Eva, go ahead. Yeah, so our uh, endovascular colleagues, they actually ended up putting a pipeline. This is uh, prior to Bobby's joining us. Uh, yeah, so they put one pipeline across the uh, aneurysm. And so this is uh, the red arrows are where the pipeline ends and begins and so then six weeks later they actually got a repeat uh angio and so like what dr stark said um you know it ended up recurring and now the the aneurysm is actually bigger than before and so the yellow arrows show you know where the the pipeline is so now we just wanted to see you know get from a panelist what they would do now that this is recurred so bobby you were right one was not enough the aneurysm is growing, but thankfully not rupturing. What would you do now? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, per, personally, I would definitely, I like the idea of placing another pipeline or potentially even two more flow diverting stents within this rather than an open option. I'd have to look at the films. I mean, I think that the tough thing about the open option is obviously that fetal system on the opposite side, which is going to need a temporary clip and a proximal clip and a distal clip with, you know, so I, I'd probably place another float Emerson and I would consider placing, you know, two and bringing them back and placing another one if they needed it. Yeah. Eva, what did so, we do? So they ended up putting uh, one additional uh, pipe, uh, pipeline stent in a telescoping arrangement within the old uh, pipeline stent and then did angioplasty. And so here, here's the red arrows are where the, the pipeline is. And so now they did another angio six weeks after the placement of the second PED. And so here's what we see. It looks kind of now, short. It looks kind of short on, the, on that view. I mean, the, these need to be really well opposed, especially if you're putting another flow diverter within a, within a flow diverter. So Bobby, don't you think, don't you think into the MCA? Yeah. Completely. I mean, that's, you know, the problem with the pipeline is as soon as you drop it at with the carotid shape like that, they, even if it's up towards the distal end of the carotid, when you drop the dis proximal end, I think everyone knows this, but the, the distal end foreshortens and uh, it comes often for PCOM aneurysms comes really close to them. So lots of people are just routinely putting them into the MCA for lesions in this location. So you guys are saying he should have covered more distally? You yes. Mean? That's the yeah, thinking. I totally agree with Chris. Yes. The other thing is, even though, you know, we're worried about a ruptured aneurysm re-rupturing, re there is stasis. So it, it's not like there's no flow diverting effect. And, right. and, you know, in this growing aneurysm, you know, you probably did a third one, but, you know, it hasn't re-ruptured. This is something that, that if we, you know, had the opportunity to run the experiment, it might actually heal. Uh, uh, even though it's it's still there and it's grown a little bit because of how slow it looks like it is. Um, but but I agree with Chris. I think a little bit distal and probably a third one now. You, you think uh, hemo, uh, the flow pattern inside the aneurysm would be different if the this second flow diverter was longer or more distally? I mean, if he crossed the neck, does it matter how long the, the diver, flow diverter is? Well, yeah, we, well, I, I don't know about for this aneurysm, Jock, but for saccular yeah. aneurysms, the longer the flow diverter, the, the, the better the occlusion rate. We did a, published a paper with a group from Calgary looking specifically at that. Uh, okay. but, but this is a different animal, obviously. Yeah. So I, I can't well, really. Well, but Chris, you're the one who said earlier, you know, the Jefferson guys told you just don't look for a month. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so you know, uh, uh, you might not look at this in a month and it would totally go away, but we looked. 
So now, Eva, I suspect you guys did another flow diverter. Uh, no, actually. No, this time, this time uh, he asked me what would I do. So ah. he, he 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 was worried. I mean, you know, he's uh, he's superb. Uh, he's an excellent technical endovascular. I had to trust him that this is not working according to him. And he asked me, should we do surgery? And I said, well, if you think it's not working, sure, I'll operate. So what, Eva, what did we do? Yeah, so we ended up... Um... Oh, so by the way, he also did a BTO and then. Oh yeah, failed uh, BTO. Yeah, failed BTO. And then here was the right vertebral injection with the right ICA BTO. So there's no uh, collaterals from PCOM. And then with the spec study as well, there's radio tracer in the left hemisphere that doesn't cross into the right hemisphere. And so, you know, because of the, all of this and because he had asked us, um, you know, if we could do surgery, we ended up uh, planning for uh, suction decompression with a Dallas maneuver to see if that would help to decompress the aneurysm and allow us to clip it. But uh, sorry, um, Eva, one second, just for the audience. Uh, I'm sure the audience may realize you can, no, no, keep playing the video. Okay. We don't want to waste time, but um, you, uh, you cannot, I mean, I, I don't dare put a temporary clip across a pipeline that it deforms it, I'm told irreversibly. So that was not an option for me. Go ahead, Eva. Yeah, so here you can see the pipeline, and then here's the aneurysm. And then you'll see here later, it's uh, M1 and A1. It's going to be coming off from here. And so... Um, so I don't know, guys, but you'll see in a second, his, his pipeline is quite a bit distal to the aneurysm. You see where the aneurysm finishes. I mean, there's a lot of pipeline beyond it. There's an A1. You saw, mm -hmm. A1, you saw the ICA bifurcation yeah, there. A1. And then, um, then we end up doing, you know, placing temporary clips and then doing suction decompression, which, you know, we tried, but we didn't think it would work anyways, because he had two pipelines and he also had that persistent trigeminal. And so as we expected, the suction decompression actually failed. So we ended up using adenosine um, to, you know, help with the clipping. And so it actually ended up allowing us to clip the aneurysm. So we ended up doing a side angled clip and a bayoneted clip. So again, for the audience, adenosine given at the time of clipping, I find in some tough aneurysms very helpful in softening it when you have no proximal control. And then, you know, you tell anesthesia, give it now, tell me when you're in asystole. The minute it's in asystole, you close the clip. I picked up that from Juha Hernesniami when he was in, in Helsinki. And, Jock, and I, another really nice job. It looks, though, on this, when you explored it, and also from the angios, that the neck was pretty crisp. Exactly. Now, you so, know. So that's nice, you know, because uh, uh, usually, as Carlos has shown us, usually the neck, there is no neck. So exactly. here it's evolved to the point where you've got something you can actually go in and clip. It didn't rupture in your face. And it was pretty crisp that you could see both sides of the neck nicely. Exactly. It's, it's actually a wonderful use of uh, complement techniques, you know, I mean, I mean, yes, his, his, his treatment should have worked probably for, due to the fetal PCOM didn't. Now, two months later, my job is a lot easier. I'm not really dealing with a blister. Uh, it, it's a well-formed wall. Interesting, isn't it? The wall is so well-formed, even though it was a blister to begin with. So that, that worked very well. So I thought that was an interesting, uh, unusual a failure of uh, flow diversion on those. So, yeah, so now uh, this is our second. What time is it? Let's see. Yes. So we've actually, we have a case, Bobby and I, in-house right now this week, and probably Bobby and I spent probably two hours uh, discussing the case. We thought we'll, we'll get, uh, Adam may know the case, but we don't want to spend too much time because it's already two hours, but Eva, do it briefly and we'll get the opinion of the panelists. So basically, he's an 11 year old male with hemifacial hypertrophy and astigmatism in the left eye. And so, just briefly, he started having a headache 12 days prior to presentation, as well as blurry vision. And because his prior hist history of astigmatism, they thought that it was just from his astigmatism. And they brought him to the ER, they gave him a migraine cocktail, and then the headache improved, and then he was sent home. And so then four days prior to presentation, he present, you know, he's had again, decreased vision in the left eye. And so, you know, because of the astigmatism, they didn't think much of it and they didn't get any CT scans to try to avoid radiation. 
And so then a few days later, he ha again had no improvement in the vision. And so he was uh, brought to an ophthalmologist who then saw, um, you know, decided to refer the patient to the ER. And so on exam, he had light perception in the left eye and he was otherwise intact. And so here was his MRI that they ended up getting. So he's got this syndrome of, I, I have to read about it. Uh, uh, yeah, he's got he's got hemifacial microsomia, which is actually usually associated with like vasculitis, and also usually a lot of vascular problems in the chest, like dextrocardia and things like that. Not so much aneurysms, in the, with the exception of like vasculitic changes. And he had Bobby. Uh, his parents were telling me. I mean, he has he had surgery for his skull for like it's not craniosynostosis but some hemifacial, hemifacial microsomia so they they have yeah. a skull problem and he needed they basically put i think fat in to help repair the defect right so bobby you want to just describe the angio what it shows yeah i mean it's i mean he's basically got this fusiform dolichotatic aneurysm that starts in the in the cavernous segment and goes all the way through the supraclinoid segment and then the A1 is is very irregular and then turns into a fusiform aneurysm. I mean, I think some of the real challenges that are, you know, without studying the films, if you pause it right there, the left A2 comes out of the dome of that fusiform ACA aneurysm. So that's key. And it's not very well fed by the right side. So she may have the 3D. Do you have the 3D Eva next? Yeah. I have the right IC injection too. And the, the anterior choroidal artery, which you'll see here, comes out of sort of the supraclinoid segment that's sort of triangular. Um, so essentially, it's two fusiform aneurysms. One is easy to understand, which is the carotid up to the anterior choroidal, and then a second left A1, A2 fusiform. Uh, and he's gone, he's lost vision relatively, not relatively, acutely in the left eye, barely some light perception. And I, pardon yeah. my ignorance, what do you think that's from, Jacques? The, the lower aneurysm or the high, upper, bigger one? No, the I, more distal. I think it's a lower. Yeah, one. that's you, what I would think too. On the cross-sectional studies. That, this that's thing what I was thinking. Way yeah. up. It's yeah, way high. Yeah. I don't know if you have the 3D that we did with the skull reconstruction, Eva, but the, the, the interesting thing is this is pushed really high. So his IC aneurysm is way, it's way above the clinoid. Um, even most of this cavernous, this part that looks cavernous, a, a good portion of that is above the clinoid. Uh, so tough case, we, um, I, any... any so uh, Chris, any well, I mean, these cases like you guys are doing appropriately, they take me sitting in front of the computer looking at all the images out. <laughs> I just yeah. spent a lot of time with these, but uh reflex kind of thinking, uh distal ACA ACA bypass, um, and proximal flow diversion reconstruction of that car of the carotid. Just to throw it out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What does does the order matter? You know, flow diversion. You need dual antiplatelets. I'm not. I I don't uh, love doing bypasses with plavix on board. Aspirin is okay, but not plavix. So if uh, you think that the proximal lesion is the urgent, you know, the visual causing lesion, you could you could treat that, and then you that puts like you say that puts the distal lesion on hold for a a while. Uh, you know, a pretty extended time. Uh, well, the problem is, as you know, um, the, they're interrelated because the yeah. Yeah. ACA is what might be the uh, collateral to the MCA. It's tough to treat one and, and, and go uh, beyond a point of no return. So we thought we should deal with the entire situation in one go. One go doesn't mean one method. One could be surgical, one could be endovascular. I mean, we, we, I don't want to drag this too long. I just thought we, we, we'll, unless, you know, uh, you hear your opinion, but we're actually planning this Saturday to do, well, exactly, I mean, what you're saying, but the double bypass. 
radial artery to MCA and A3 to A3 bypass. I, I told, you know, Bobby has been thinking, well, it can, is there a decent endovascular option to treat the whole thing? And I'll let him speak, but back and forth. I mean, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but I thought, look, I'd rather do more rather than less uh, on this 11. Oh. After the bypasses, you're planning to deconstruct or are you going to then do? Trap, yeah, to trap. I don't know. I wrote down about 20 options that I came up with for this and just tried yeah. to start like putting them in order. I really can't say that I was too happy with any of the endovascular options. I mean, I think the whole segment is disease. So whether you sack the ACA and flow divert the bottom or whether you sack the bottom, and then come back and deal with the top. I, I don't think those were good options. I mean, I, at one point I was sort of leaning towards a radial bypass for the MCA and then can, and then testing the ACA and considering just sacking the ACA. But um, I, don't, I don't know that there's a great option. I don't know that we need the distal bypass for the ACA, but maybe that's something that we can test intraoperatively after doing a radial to MCA bypass. I guess that's that's my one thought. The the outflow from the A2 is very slow. So my hope would be one bypass and we can trap everything else. Um, but the other option would be to be prepared to do a distal A3, A3. And uh, I was asking Bobby if he had a good way to do a BTO of the left A1. Because that would certainly simplify it if I, we don't have to do a bypass distally. But uh, there, there is a, a picture you don't see. There is a layer of thrombus in the carotid aneurysm. And Bobby was yeah. not too keen on crossing the big aneurysm to go test the left A1. So there's a super client, there's a stenosis right there. So if you came from the left ICA, I wouldn't want to go through that aneurysm and put a balloon in the A1. I mean, at one point I was thinking, well, we, we could put up a balloon. We, we could put a balloon in the left ICA and do a run from the right ICA. And that would show us the left A1. And then we can come across the ACOM and down the A1 and put a balloon in. But again, you're going to be putting a balloon across the ACOM through that dysmorphic segment. And I just didn't think that that was a reasonable, a reasonably safe option. Sorry, it's a complicated one, but we thought we'll use your presence today since Bobby and I have been chatting about this the last couple of days. Maybe we'll show the case in a next M&M &M conference or a, <laughs> or no, a good Josh, I, I wonder long term what's going to happen. You know, the bypasses, including changing flow dynamics in a kid who's obviously got something wrong with his vessels. What's going to be the next surprise? I don't know. I'm going to, well, I mean, I guess Bobby has already, I, I have not read about the syndrome to see what we know about it regarding blood vessels, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just, I started making the slides for, for the Jackson Hole meeting. <laughs> Take my name off it. Say it's all your complication. <laughs> if, if it goes perfectly, it's case. Good luck, Marcos, guys. but if there's any issue, of course, it's definitely, it's all me. That's right. Guys, I thank you for, we kept you two hours, 10 minutes, spectacular conversations. Adam and I have a dinner to go to. Uh, Adam, I'll see you at dinner in a few minutes. Uh, thank you for the audience. Thank you for excellent talks. See you all soon. Thank you, Jacques.